Hey, welcome back, everyone. I'm glad you're back. And I'm glad you're back because it means that you're on a journey to find a better picture of God than the one you have. And I, you've come to the right place. It's not because I'm amazing. It's because I found him and I want you to find him. So I told you I was going to tell you a true story. We're going to start there. And we'll build on it. I found out uh, a few years back that um, there was a woman who dedicated years and years and years and years and years of her life to teaching kids every weekend in church about God. Bible stories from Genesis to Revelation. Crafts. Put her heart and soul into that class. But the woman herself did not believe that she would be in heaven. She did not believe that when God returned to save his people, as the Bible describes, when Jesus comes back for us in my father's house or many mansions, if it were not so, I would have told you, I'm going to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I'm going to return to bring you with me that where I am, there you may be also. She didn't believe it. She did not believe it. You say, well, why? I mean, how could you... How could you hold the Bible in your hands, tell the stories to kids over and over, week after week, year after year, for decades, and yet not believe that, he's, that he can save you? Well, here's her story. Got married way, way back in the day. Rural community, hard times, poor people. Her husband hard, worked hard farming all summer, left in the winter to log, came back in the spring, started again. Any of you who know, if you have to live apart from your spouse for months at a time, it's hard. And I don't know the details, and it's really not important, but you can see where this is going. One winter... Somebody else came along and she got pregnant. Of course, when her husband came back in the spring, it clearly wasn't his. Divorced. Child from a man she wasn't married to. Back in those days, big scandal. Especially when you go to church and you're supposed to be one of the good people who don't do things like that. And the weight of how she was supposed to be and the weight of her failure became bigger in her mind and in her heart than God's ability and willingness and desire to forgive. Before we go any further, I want you to think about that. The woman taught kids week after week, week after week, year after year, year after year, decade after decade. Stories from the Bible, yet didn't believe that the author would forgive her. There's something about our own sin that somehow weighs heavier on us than the sins of other people. And the church should be the place where we're reminded God loves you. God wants to forgive you. God has forgiven you. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the whole world. If we confess our sins, says the Bible, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from any and all unrighteousness. Moses murdered a man. 
David killed countless people. You say, well, that's war. That's different. David raped a woman and then had her husband murdered to cover it up, try and cover it up because she got pregnant. And later God said, David's a man after my own heart. Not because God was happy with what he did or proud of what he did, far from it. But David recognized what he did, was sorry for what he did, and trusted his forgiveness and his life into the hands of an all-merciful God. The Bible says where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. In other words, you cannot out sin God's ability to forgive. It cannot be done. The church should be the place where that truth is repeated over and over and over. Because somehow my sins seem worse to me than the sins of other people. I can believe that God can forgive other people, but somehow when I do it, it seems heavier, different, worse. So that woman taught kids for years and years and years, decade on decade, hoping that they would believe, but not believing herself. Up to this point in this channel where I've been telling stories, I've been trying to get you to think about how we think versus how God might actually be. Today I'm going to begin using the Bible to show you, it's not my opinion, that God is better than we say. And I want to begin with the verse that we just quoted earlier. In my Father's house are many rooms, mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again to receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Jesus said those words. Before he said those words, he said, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are. The tricky part of that story is that it starts at the beginning of a chapter. And being the humans that we are and being used to chapter books and books being divided, we, we, you know, we read a chapter a night or we read whatever. And chapters tend to break up the story. But in the Bible, when the Bible was originally written in Hebrew and Greek and some Aramaic, there were no chapters. We made those. We put them in later to make it easier to find stuff, the verses, all that all that was put in later to make it easier to navigate, but it was never there to begin with. So chapter 13 flowed into chapter 14 without a chapter break. Gospel of John, by the way, if you're wondering. The end of chapter 13 of the Gospel of John is a conversation between Jesus and Peter. A conversation that was not an easy one conversation in which Jesus wasn't correcting Peter for something he had done wrong. He was telling him what he was going to do wrong. He says, Peter, you're going to deny me before this is over. Oh, no, I won't. Yeah, you will, Peter. You'll deny me three times, actually. No, I won't. I die for you. I won't deny you. You will. But let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going to prepare a place for you. You who are going to deny me three times. In my greatest hour of pain and need. When I can't hear my father. See my father. 
feel my father. When the church that I blessed and pled with and prayed for turns on me. When they're about to crucify me. In my deepest, darkest hour of need, you're going to curse and swear and say you don't even know me. But don't let your heart be troubled. Don't let your heart be troubled, Peter. You're going to be tempted to wear your mistake so tightly wrapped around you that it will choke the hope right out of you. Don't do it. In my Father's house are many rooms. It's big enough for you. I'm going to prepare a place for you. And I'm going to come back. I'm going to get you. I'm going to bring you home. Because my love is not dependent on your behavior. It's not contingent on your successes or your failures. I love you with an everlasting love where your sin abounds. My grace abounds all the more. I'm glad you're here. I don't want any one of you to spend any longer in guilt and shame and fear than you have to. Because God is better than that. We'll see you next time.